In our hearts, we know it's true. Worship is more than just singing songs together. But so often, our language and our actions betray the fact that we consider worship to be that thing that happens between the first and last note of the song set on Sunday mornings. But if we're going to approach our Sunday morning gathering in, in such a way that it's all done to the glory of God, if the whole of Sunday morning is going to be worshipful, then we're going to have to ensure that our language and our actions align with what we know to be true in our hearts. Before the singing begins, we have so much opportunity as God's people to honor Him, to act in worship of Him as we act in love and service and grace towards one another. Peter, writing in his letter to the church, 1 Peter 4, 7-10, through 10, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Now, Peter begins this, this passage, this call to action with a sense of urgency. The end of all things is near. It is at hand. There is no time to waste. We can't put these things off. We can't wait and do them later. We can't do something and then get to it. These are things that must be done now. He calls us to, to the sense of urgency so that we listen up and understand we need to be busy about doing these things today because the end is near. But he's not doing this to in, induce havoc or, or panic. He's not trying to play on our fears or cause chaos. In fact, look where he starts. The end is at hand, so be sober-minded, be self-controlled so that you can be a praying people, so that, so that your lifestyle doesn't, it, it doesn't hinder your prayer life so that the way you act doesn't hinder the way you pray. So, so start looking at yourself. Control your thoughts. Control your actions so that you can pursue God in prayer. So it's not about chaos. He's not about fear. He's not about causing, a, creating panic. He, he's really calling us to something important and, and calling us to prioritize something that's vital. Above all, do these things. So his call to his his sense of urgency moves to a call to prioritize certain activity and certain attitudes. It should be evident in our lives. It should be should be able to be seen in the ways that we act and interact, the ways that we treat and think about one another. Now these these actions and these attitudes they shouldn't just be limited to Sunday morning. This should mark the the whole life of a Christian. But because Sunday morning is is one of the most intentional and purposeful times that Christians gather together, these actions and attitudes should definitely not be absent from Sunday morning. It, they should be plainly evident. They should be on, 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 on display for anyone who, who comes in and is among us, that they see these actions and attitudes, that they see the, the recognition that there is priority and urgency, and that above all, we act and think and, and treat one another in these ways. And this isn't going to happen by accident. It's not, it's, it's not going to just organically occur. We are going to have to understand what Peter's calling us to and then intentionally, purposefully, determinatively apply these things to the ways that we interact with one another and the ways that we attend and participate in church on Sunday morning. This means that we're going to have to determine before we ever show up on Sunday morning, before we ever get to the place that we're deciding to do something other than attend church on Sunday morning, we are going to have to realize the priority and the purpose of being together and, and, and what we're going to do once we're together. So, so we're going to have to prioritize attendance at church, not so much for what we can get out of it, but for what we have to offer while we're there. So we're going to have to attend church no longer in the way that we go to Walmart and consume and, and, and with little concern or care for, for Walmart, just taking what we want. We're going to have to attend church with the idea of well, we, there's something in it for us. There's something for us to get in it, but there's also great things that we have to offer. We're going to have to adopt a missional attitude about our Sunday morning gatherings. We're going to have to approach 
the Sunday morning gathering as if we're missionaries who are living to the glory of God and agents of his mission. Because as the gospel is proclaimed through the songs that we sing, through the preaching of the word, through the observance of our sacraments, it is also exemplified in the ways that we act towards one another. This demands that, that attendance and participation are made a priority. Again, not, for what, not, not simply for what we can get, but for what we can give. Peter calls believers to do this, is to, to act this way towards one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Because we have received grace, we, need, we now get to, to, be, be, to bestow that grace. We get to wield that grace as if it were a sword. But it's not to hurt and damage people, it's to bless and serve and love people. You and I, believer, get to show God's grace in real and tangible ways. So when we're together and we purposefully and intentionally love one another and serve one another, we're showing God's grace to one another. And for anyone who's watching, we're showing His grace in real and tangible ways. When we smile and welcome someone we don't know, it's just it's something as simple as a smile. When we smile and and greet someone that we don't know and welcome them in and take time to have conversation with a stranger. Uh, we, we allow that person to experience God's grace, not just in theory, but in literal and tangible ways. So the Sunday morning missionary shows up early. They, they take initiative. They, they look for opportunities to serve one another. They pray for one another. They welcome others and they encourage others to see the beauty and majesty of our Creator and Savior for, for that one singular purpose. He is glorified. And so here's, here's, here's something interesting that happens when we do this. See, we not only then act in worship, but we become worship leaders. As we worship by loving, serving, and acting hospitably, we're not only enabling people to experience God's grace, we're, we're actually leading them to respond in worship. We're giving them reason to see God as He is and respond in awe and, and, and stepping in to, to, to live also to His glory. As we worship by leading others to worship, God's glory then is magnified. And it's, it's like compounding interest. And He deserves every ounce of adoration and awe. He deserves all of the glory.